I trained at Johns Hopkins, um, near-death experiences were not part of our curriculum. <laughs> However, my professors did teach me something that changed my life. And that was to always ask patients open-ended questions, to never assume that you know what the answers are that a patient is gonna give you. So when I saw Crystal in follow-up, at this point, we didn't know why she had nearly drowned. Had she had a seizure? Uh, was, you know, the, you know the, it was important to understand uh, why she had come to be at the bottom of the swimming pool. And so I simply asked her in an open-ended way, what do you remember about when you were at the swimming pool? And she said to me, do you mean when I was in heaven? And uh, really, I laughed just like I'm laughing now and it kind of rolled my eyes. And she reached over and patted my hand and said, you'll see, Dr. Morse, heaven is fun. She went on to describe her entire resuscitation, just as, as she said. Um, she got every detail correct. Uh, I'll just tell you one uh, briefly, as uh, she mentioned that uh, she saw us uh, putting a tube in her nose uh, to help her to breathe. Uh, when you see uh, doctors uh, on TV intubate patients, invariably the tube comes out of their mouth. Um, uh, our team uh, intubated patients nasally uh, through the nose, and uh, she was absolutely right about that uh, detail. And that told me right there that this was not some sort of invention of her mind from you know watching television or whatever, but that she had actually seen us. I then returned to Seattle Children's Hospital uh, where I was based and uh, determined to study this uh, phenomenon further. Okay, um, I just want to point this out. We were in our, the medical establishment. Um, this, this is not, you know, uh, the, I did my study uh, with the head of the intensive care unit, uh, with the head of the Department of uh, uh, Child Neurology. Uh, that was uh, where my fellowship was uh, in child neurology. Um, so, you know, we were, we were uh, the medical establishment and we were uh, determined to figure out why these experiences happened. Uh, I had uh, met um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and discussed these experiences with her, and I thought she was wrong. Um, I thought that these were caused by probably a lack of oxygen to the brain, or we uh, give uh, patients uh, during the process of resuscitation uh, drugs that cause dissociation, meaning a sense of being out of the body. So that was what our study uh, was designed uh, to uh, research. And I just, you know, just over the years, I've seen people, you know, many people are skeptical as we were. And so I'm just pointing out that uh, we designed our study from the most skeptical point of view. Uh, fortunately, um, again, uh, I was well-trained and we always believed that we wanted to hear uh, the other point of view as well. Uh, I was based at Seattle Children's Hospital. Uh, uh, my professors had told me uh, to go down to Harborview and meet with uh, Kim Clark uh, Sharp, and she told me of an experience uh, that a patient had described to her of being out of her physical body and seeing a tennis shoe on the ledge of a hospital, one that would not be ordinarily, uh, you know, you couldn't ordinarily see by looking out the window, and uh, sure enough, uh, she, um, in fact, uh, validated that that patient had uh, truly seen something in the out-of-body state, as had Crystal. So we made sure uh, that uh, we, uh, you know, that we, uh, in consultation uh, with uh, Kimberly, we made sure that uh, our uh, protocol you know, was designed to uh, assess any outcome. So... Uh, I, this is a, a long slide, and I, I don't really have, you know, I think if people look at it afterwards, it's fine. But I want to point something out. Our study is what's known as prospective, and that's the gold standard of medical studies. So we didn't take volunteers. Raymond Moody, my wonderful brother-in-law, you know, he did his study where people would come up to him and tell him about their experiences. That is not what we did. We identified in advance 
the patients we wanted to study. And they were survivors of cardiac arrest. And we studied all survivors of cardiac arrest. Uh, we had two patients that uh, declined to uh, be part of our study. But other than that, uh, we uh, studied all survivors of cardiac arrest at Seattle Children's Hospital over a 15-year period of time. So this is not, uh, you know, we, we did not know whether they had near-death experiences or not. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, nobody at the hospital had ever heard of a near-death experience. Um, and we carefully compared these patients uh, to other patients who were really sick, but not at the point of death. And always we wanted to answer this question. Or was it real? This is a young man that had a near-death experience as part of our study. And he said to me, but was it real, Dr. Morris? Because if it was real, you have to tell all the old people. <laughs> um, and, but his story is primarily the reason that I'm here today. Um, my wife is quite ill. It's a, you know, and I've lectured many times and I don't particularly like leaving home. Um, but we heard these experiences for the first time. And when children, probably adults as well, tell these experiences for the first time, there's aspects to them that are never heard again. And I feel an obligation to share these experiences with you because they, they cannot be told any other way. And this young man is an example of this. He told me that during his experience, he was in a huge noodle. And then he goes, no, it couldn't have been a noodle because noodles don't have rainbows in them. It must have been a tunnel. And sure enough, he had never described this experience as being in a huge noodle again. And I just feel really a responsibility, you know, to hear this type of story for the first time. And that, I mean, that's so obviously validating. <laughs> you know, this is, a, again, not an experience that he's making up. <laughs> it's a big noodle, you know, but doesn't have, a, doesn't have a, you know, rainbow in it. And if near-death experiences are real, then all of the spiritual experiences surrounding death and dying are real. And those are more difficult to study from a scientific perspective. We're able to study near-death experiences because these are patients in a hospital setting. Uh, we can uh, carefully compare them to control patients, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, and yet there's a wide variety of spiritual experiences, which if near-death experiences are real, these must be real, even if they're harder to prove after-death visitations, which, by the way, occur to about 70% of parents who have uh, a child who has passed. So these are very common experiences, frequently dismissed as not being real. Shared dying experiences, premonitions of death, the lucid dreams of death and dying, and all the other spiritual intuitions. So I consider this question an extremely important one. Are these experiences real? And our team you know, as I told you, we are from the medical establishment, and we did our best to answer that question. Here's an example. Uh, this is from a friend of mine uh, whose daughter died at age 10. Um, this is the last picture taken of her, except uh, that it was uh, blank. Uh, it was her against the white hospital wall. One year from uh, the anniversary of her death, the picture uh, that my friend had changed into this picture. So again, you know, that's, you know, that's proof to him, but that's not proof of anything. And yet the first thing he did when he heard our study is he said, if near-death experiences are real, then what happened with my daughter is real. And you can see the striking resemblance between that and the previous picture. And not only are they real, but think of the information of the near-death experience. We die in a sea of love. Consciousness survives the death of the body. Or at the very least, when we die, consciousness suddenly awakes in an expanded sense. 
and that the meaning of life is to learn specific lessons of love. This is a story I've heard again and again from children who've had near-death experiences, and I consider that to be a scientific statement in the year 2022. Okay. <laughs> extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. God, I, I'm so sick of hearing that kind of... <laughs> that, that, first of all, that's absolutely not true. We're in the middle of a paradigm shift, and paradigm shifts do not come because of one remarkable case. Paradigm shifts, as I will get to, come because a whole host of small studies throughout the scientific and, frankly, the cultural and spiritual community lead to something new. And there's been many such paradigm shifts uh, in the Western culture uh, in the last you know, thousand years, and we're very familiar with how they occur. However, having said that, our study was extraordinary. It was well done. It was well crafted. It was published in the American Medical Association's um, pediatric journals, and it was nothing short of extraordinary. 24 out of our uh, identified patients of cardiac arrest described having a near death experience. I would guess. 99% of them had never mentioned it, even perhaps to their parents. None of our control patients had anything remotely like a near-death experience. So those are the patients who treated with dissociated drugs, lack of oxygen to the brain, uh, you know, diseases that you would expect that they might die from, but they weren't actually close to death. The scary intensive care unit uh, stresses. 